The US parent has indicated that it wants to reduce headcount both in sales and manufacturing by 10% across the board. This will have the following impact. And then there's a, a table showing the various reductions. So in England, they're going to lose 20 staff in sales, 90 staff in manufacturing. In France, 10 in sales and 40 in manufacturing. Germany, 20 in sales and 90 in manufacturing. And Netherlands, 5 in sales and 25 in manufacturing. Um, so I, I suppose the first question, and I'm going to ask Olivier this, is how closely will the courts look at uh, an employer's decision to declare redundancies, Olivier, in France? Well, I'm afraid the answer is very closely. They will uh, check not only the uh, reality of the economic reasons, but they would also check the incidence on the redundancy. They would check the effort of the employer in order to find a redeployment. So it's really a kind of a full scope of uh, what should have been done, what should be done, and what can be done in order to save as much um, jobs as possible. Okay. And, and Laurie, let's look at the English perspective, shall we? Well, it's, it's often said by employees that uh, maybe the company should sell one of its company jets rather than make employees redundant. Um, but uh, in practice, certainly when you're dealing with collective redundancies, that's not something that an English court or tribunal would consider. Um, sometimes in individual cases, uh, the tribunal will look at the rationale, especially where maybe the employee is alleging that this isn't a redundancy at all, this is just a disguised um, uh, capability dismissal or something of that nature. But where you're dealing with this kind of collective redundancy, uh, an English court or tribunal just will simply not get involved in whether the um, decision in principle to make redundancies is a good business decision or not. Uh, and Axel? Um, I think it's slightly comparable to the UK. The court would only uh, look into if this is an unreasonable uh, uh, action that is, has been taken, if this uh, has, is somehow linked to a business reason. They would not uh, uh, look into it very deeply. Uh, it has to just be objectively uh, uh, not a completely stupid thing to do. Thank you. And Regina in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, there's actually a little bit of unbalance between the legal framework and uh, that what the Dutch labor organization says that it does and what it in fact does. Um, uh, because um, the um, dismissal for uh, uh, business economical reasons is mainly judged by the Dutch Labour Organization, UWV, and they say they have a marginal check. Um, they say they will, as um, my other uh, colleagues say, they will only look at the, fa the, the question whether or not there was a reasonable decision a reasonable entrepreneur could have made the decision. But in practice, um, you will need to prove um, the grounds for dismissal. So it could be organizational, it could be economical or financial, but the UWV requests a lot, a lot of information to, uh, from the employer to substantiate the grounds for dismissal. Um, and if you don't, um, if, if you provide everything, then normally the grounds will be accepted. But if not, it will be the request will be dis um, uh, rejected for that reason. Okay. Um, we might come back to some of those issues. Axel, in, in terms of collective redundancy consultation, can you tell us what the thresholds are in Germany that have to be respected? In principle, it's 5% of the. Uh, employees of the corporation. So this is slightly different to other jurisdictions where it uh, always depends on the operation. In Germany, it's based on the number of employees in the corporation, so in the legal entity, and uh, the threshold is 5%. These 5% these has two impacts. The one impact is, as you said, mandatory consultation with the, with the Works Council, if a Works Council is present. Um, Consultation with the Works Council means you are obliged to enter into, or no, to be very precise, to, to try to get to an uh, equal, equal interest agreement and to conclude a social plan. This is what uh, co-determination rights mean in this case. The other thing where the threshold is important, the 5% is exceeding the 5% means you have to do a mass termination uh, a notification to the authorities. 
it's very formal, uh, but it has to be done otherwise if you miss to do it or you miss to do it in the right way. Uh, any termination based or done in this period of time is invalid by law. So you, it doesn't even make, sense, uh, even make sense to send your lawyer to the court if you have uh, missed to do the, uh, uh, the mass termination notification. You can stay at home and just uh, uh, re-employ the employees. And the mass termination notice, is that a fairly simple form to fill out? Or? No, not at all. Uh, <laughs> it used to be a very simple form, uh, but the judges uh, tend to ask for more and more information. And I think nowadays this is the uh, biggest liability for law firms is to fill in this form. Right. That's good to know. And, <laughs> and Olivier, uh, in, in France, what, what are the... So in France, if, it, if you are talking of redundancy of less than 10 employees, there is a consultation of the workers' representation. But if you are talking of 10 and over, then it's a more complicated uh, process because you have what we call a social plan. Now it's called PSE. I brought some, some examples here. There's no question of confidentiality because this is some things I've, I, I found on internet. This one, for instance, is 149 pages, so that's quite a dramatic. We have got several which are a bit less, but it's, it's often between 50 and 150 pages. So you have to explain all the economic reasons and what you have done in order to, to save uh, some employees and to uh, find what they can do after redundancy. So it's, it's quite hard work to, to, to produce this document, and if you don't, then the, you cannot dismiss. Right, okay, thank you. And, and Laurie, the thresholds in the UK? Well, the thresholds in the UK are based on the numbers being dismissed uh, within a period of 90 days at any one establishment. Uh, an establishment is usually understood as being kind of a cross between a business unit and a individual site. Um, I'm sure a number of you have picked up on the cases that there were about what amounts to an establishment. Uh, there was the Woolworths and Usdor case, and um, probably the prettiest name in all of employment litigation, Bluebird and Little, uh, was the other case dealing with uh, establishment. Um, there was controversy over what actually an establishment might be. Those cases went all the way to the European Court of Justice, who uh, confirmed uh, that the um, standard um, British interpretation of establishment was okay and was compatible with uh, European Union law. So in fact, um, the, state, the uh, situation on establishment is as it was before the Woolworths and uh, Little cases. It was as it's always been understood uh, under English law. But the threshold is 20 or more people within a period of 90 days uh, at any one establishment. Thank you, Laurie. And um, just moving on now, Olivier has already mentioned a social plan. Um, and the, some of the needs in, in France. Is that replicated in, in, in the Netherlands? In the Netherlands, uh, just a short, you mentioned the thresholds too. It's, um, I haven't come to that yet. It's tw um, more than 20 employees in a certain region in the Netherlands uh, in a period of three months' time. And it's not a statutory obligation to come to a social plan, um, but when the Collective Dismissal uh, Act is applicable uh, above the threshold, then um, the obligation is to report this collective dismissal to the uh, Dutch labor organization and also to the trade unions involved. And these trade unions, there will then be a one month waiting period. And in this waiting period, normally the trade unions will report um, to the employer to want to discuss, for example, social plan. And in practice, you see that although it's not a statutory obligation, it happens a lot. Okay, thank you. I, I'm sorry, Jean. You, you talked about the um, number of employees in a particular region. So is, is the Netherlands broken down into to a number of regions? Yeah, in a few districts, about, I think, about eight districts in the Netherlands. And when you want to dismiss 20 or more in this certain district, then right. the threshold is met. Yeah. So that's, that's very different from, yeah. from the other countries. That's it. That's interesting. Um, OK, moving on. So the social plan, Olivier, you've shown us or mentioned is sort of running to 160 odd pages. That's presumably going to take quite some time to put together. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm afraid it's going to take even more time if at some point the unions decide that 
it, it, it doesn't re, re, uh, um, it doesn't comply with their requirements and take you to the judge to the tribunal and ask the tribunal to say that the social plan doesn't allow enough so it can be complicated it can be long the process can be stopped by the tribunal uh, it's, it's not an easy way to uh, to dismiss people I agree with you right and presumably the same problems exist in in Germany yeah so uh, the as the interest agreement the equal interest agreement the social plan are mandatory um, the the procedure is that you you are obliged to sit together but what happens if the Works Council refuses or delays the negotiation? Uh, for this case, if you have tried to come to an agreement with the Works Council, uh, but the Works Council refuses or the employer uh, refuses, uh, both are entitled to uh, call the, uh, a, a, a kind of uh, mediation committee. And the mediation committee can make, make a binding social plan. Um, this links quite nicely to your first question uh, about the economics of the and the reasoning, the business reasoning, because you need to be very careful in Germany to be too optimistic with your business reasoning for the layoffs. If it comes to the mediation committee, the mediation committee will take the uh, sp the savings you are predicting with this uh, measure uh, and multiply it by five, and this is the pot for redundancy payments. So this is a tricky thing. You need to somehow demonstrate that there's a business reasoning behind it, but you should not be too uh, optimistic about savings or economic uh, up upsides with this, uh, uh, because afterwards you are punished by the mediation committee uh, growing your pot for redundancies. So this is a very, you have to weigh this and to be very careful how to phrase the, your approach to the Works Council uh, not to be punished afterwards. And Regina? It's a, a similar mechanism in... And, and one thing, Sorry. maybe one thing I want, want to mention also that is a very good mechanism under German law for equal interest agreement and social plan. You are, you can in an in equal interest agreement make a so-called name list. So you mention every employee you want to make redundant by name. This has the effect that this employee is not longer well, he can go to court, but it does not, not make sense because he's going to lose. Um, if you combine this with a voluntary social plan, there is one case where it is possible. If you have 5% of, more than 5% of employees uh, uh, dismissed, but less of 10% with a pure, uh, pure layoff, then you have a voluntary social plan. And then you can combine it. You have people on the name list, and on the other side, you have a voluntary social plan where you say everybody who goes to court loses everything. That makes nobody go to court, of course, because they uh, better keep their money from the social plan. Uh, and this is a very neat thing that, to my understanding, not many people use in Germany, um, but it is a very handy uh, uh, mechanism to reduce the number of, uh, of claims if you have a big measure like this. Mm, that, that sounds very interesting. And Regina, in, in the Netherlands, how does this conflict play out? Uh, the social plan is very important. We tend to see uh, um, things like this <laughs> too in the Netherlands. So it's a lot of work to uh, put together a good social plan. But actually, I see many advantages of uh, such a plan and also the uh, involvement of uh, trade unions and works council. Um, I see in other countries sometimes that uh, especially employers are a little bit wary of works councils and trade unions, but in the Netherlands, um, when you have a good process before you actually make the redundancies, you have a good uh, consultation uh, process with your works council and also um, uh, um, the trade unions are involved, it gives a lot of justification to a redundancy which will uh, mean that in the Netherlands you need prior permission to be able to dismiss an employee. Um, the the um, dismissal is often um, uh, agreed upon by the judge much easier and also the Dutch labor organization will ask a lot of less questions if the works council was involved in the um, process before. Another thing is that um, you have less discussion about severance, the level of severance, because 
um, the cantonal courts in the Netherlands have ruled that if there is a social plan agreed upon by the trade unions, um, they will um, almost always uh, follow the social plan. So you will not have individual discussions about the level of severance. And that will lead to a situation that um, you are um, often, um, uh, it is possible to come to simple settlement agreements with the employees because everybody exactly knows what they're going to get. So you will uh, prevent a lot of court proceedings and will simply make settlement agreements and that will make the process after much faster. Thank you. And I've ignored you, Laurie, for a, a little time. Uh, we don't have a social plan in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps, um, uh, Barry, perhaps we could add something. I don't know if I should mention that, but uh, I've been told that sometimes the money, instead of going on the table into the social plan, could sometime go directly to some of the union and that it would make the whole process go a little more quicker, a little more smoothly. I haven't been witness of any of these cases, but I know that it can have happened sometime. So I'm just mentioning that because I've noticed that some of the social plan, which are not very generous, in not very much in favor of some of the employees, seem to work very well, whereas some other ones, which seem to be more generous, seems to encounter some difficulties. So I'm just mentioning yes. that point. We did, we did have quite an interesting discussion this morning about this sort of issue, and I think, Axel, you've got a couple of comments to make as well. Yeah, so it is not unusual that uh, in Germany, the Works Council, so I have to distinguish between Works Council and Union. On the one side, it's not very unusual that the Works Council, whose your party you are negotiating with, is asking for special favors. Uh, for Works Council members in a social plan. What is okay to a certain extent because Works Council members are s protected, so it, it is okay to do something additional for Works Council members, but it can go over the top. For example, I just mentioned the, the case from a, uh, from a uh, German uh, automotive uh, company where the head of the Works Council asked for a Phaeton as a company car. Uh, uh, w, uh, VW, and he got it. And this was uh, uh, examined by the state attorney and was found as bribery, and they got fined for it. Um, so yes, on the one side, it is okay to smoothen the process with some of the request, following some of the requests, but you need to be really aware of that you don't step over the line of bribery because this is something in the in this last two, three years where state attorneys look really into it and see if uh, there is bribery to, um, uh, in favor of works councils. With the unions, what they do, and there's a standard, they ask for funds. So if you do a, a, a collective agreement with a, with a union, uh, they will ask for a fund where the company has to pay a certain amount of money and the union is free to distribute this fund to their members because the, the company does not know who is union member. Union members don't have to disclose that they are union members. So any regulation saying union members get 10% more than the 10% uh, more severance payment would not work because nobody knows who the union member is. But the unions do know who their members are so they use the fund distributing it and um, this, is, this has been looked at by the courts and they've said this is okay uh, every, because everybody is free to become a union member. And uh, in the German constitution, it is one part, it is one article saying that you are free to be, become member of a, of a union and therefore it's a constitutional right to become a union member and therefore a fund uh, of this kind is okay. But isn't it discrimination between different sort of work? Well, workers? Dis discrimination is if you treat the same with differently. Uh, what the court is saying, you treat, uh, you are not uh, treating the uh, same people differently, but you're treating different people differently because you're treating union members differently to non-union union members. And the definition of discrimination is treating the same differently. I would be with you. Uh, I, I, I have also a big question mark. But the, you have to understand, in Germany, unions, the, the union rights are extremely strong. As you can see, that this is part of the 
of the German constitution is a right to become a union member. Uh, that also demonstrates that it is uh, a, a really a very strong right in Germany uh, to be a union member. And Regina, have you seen this sort of facilitation payment, if I can call it that loosely, yeah. uh, in the Netherlands? Yeah, I saw it, um, but that was already uh, some time ago. I think uh, under pressure of this equal treatment and these uh, special uh, facilities for uh, uh, Works Council uh, members or uh, trade union members tend to get less and less. Uh, we um, have proceedings in the Netherlands about social plans, for example, um, uh, not uh, abiding by equal treatment laws for um, these kinds of things, but also, for example, uh, uh, granting more uh, more severance to older employees, etc. It, it's beginning to become a little bit more different in the Netherlands. Okay, thank you. And, and I just wanted to turn finally to look at the type of selection criteria that might be used uh, in this type of scenario. Laurie, can you sort of outline what might be a typical set of criteria? Yes, it, um, it's very common um, in Britain for mass redundancies like this to be dealt with through a redundancy scoring uh, matrix. Um, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with the ones that you use within your own particular um, businesses and institutions. Um, what I always like to see from my clients is that the criteria that are selected are criteria that relate specifically to the needs of the business. Um, so it may very well be justified to look at um, what you need going forward uh, in your new business as opposed to what you have needed in the past. Uh, that is uh, sometimes where things like uh, flexibility, like a range of skills can come in and be scored uh, or be given particular weight. Um, I like to see selection criteria that um, have some sort of justification or backing behind the scores. So if you are going to be looking at things like job performance, uh, it's very good if you've got documentation to back that up, which might be, uh, for instance, in a sales environment, sales figures, uh, may very well be things like appraisal documents. Uh, and certainly I think whenever you're looking at um, performance-based scoring, it's well worthwhile going back um, and having a look at the appraisal documents for the individual. Um, there's no end of times when I've seen people receive low scorings in uh, redundancy selection criteria, despite having received quite high scorings in their appraisal. Um, and I've also seen it be rather difficult for managers to explain that difference when it comes to employment tribunal hearings. Um, so certainly I think Possibly um, the first document I would pick out whenever I was looking at carrying out redundancy scoring would be the appraisal. Um, maybe that if you're in a sales or uh, some other environment where there are easily measurable metrics, um, you can get out something like that as well. Uh, but the appraisal, I think, is always going to be quite an influential and important document uh, in developing your, um, developing your selection criteria in the first place, because presumably, um, the qualities you're looking for in your uh, employees are the same sort of qualities you measure them against in their appraisal, um, but also for then carrying out the um, redundancy marking and scoring itself. That's not to say that it all has to match up with the appraisal. Uh, there may be perfectly good reasons why somebody who was scored highly six months ago in their appraisal is now scored less highly. Uh, but where there are differences and discrepancies, um, I would expect the manager to be aware of those and to be able to uh, explain the differences to any tribunal that wanted to know. And, and Olivier, in France, Laurie's mentioned the forward-looking criteria. They, is that what you have in France? Yes, we have got several uh, criteria. We have got dependency, seniority, handicap, employability, and professional skills. And of course, the employer would often say, well, I take the last one. That's the one I like the best. But it, it doesn't work like that. You have to take into account all of them. And uh, of course, you can say that one is uh, more important to use than uh, another one. But you have to, uh, when you write a social plan, you have to take into account all these criteria. So um, you mentioned handicap. Presumably, does that mean that if somebody is disabled, they have to be treated or they score better. Yes, that's right. They do, yes. okay. And I think you, you also mentioned married and children. So if they've got yes. lots of children, they're more that's likely right. to stay in their job. That's right. Okay. And Axel, how about, how about Germany? Yeah, pretty much the same criteria. Um, 
when you think this through, uh, if you do a, some layoffs round after round, you are left with the old and the disabled, uh, because these are the ones who are always protected. And uh, the um, the re the, uh, the the solution for this is that you can build groups of age. So you can say, we do the selection from for the ones. 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, although this, what I say, is not 100% correct, so the groups are different, but just to give you an idea, and then makes a social selection between, in between the groups so that you have a, a fair spread of uh, age within your company even after a certain uh, uh, round of redundancies. So that would mean that you could pick people from each particular age Yes, group. So you would p pick people from the uh, age, uh, from a certain age, and then make this, uh, you give them the points, and who have, have the least points have to go. Uh, the, the, the trigger, however, is because if you do this with your clients, you will always find the, the ones with the most points are the ones who should leave. For some reason. This is uh, somehow the nature of the, of the process. The, the way how to deal with it is that you, because you only have to compare comparable positions, and this is where you, under German law, would start to, start to think and to be become creative and say, okay, is this a comparable position? And it's always on the same hierarchical level. Uh, and then this is the major work in such a redundancy process where we would work 60% of our time is to see, okay, what are the people that can, are, are to be compared? Where, what is the argument for keep this person instead of this person? Uh, why is this position not comparable to this position? Uh, do we maybe give some more points for disabled but less for this because then we protect this employee? Uh, I, normally you hear it's not about persons, it's just uh, about layoff, but in the end it's always cherry picking. That's at least my experience. And to make this cherry picking legally solid uh, you need to be really creative and to dig into it and see what is the job position, what are the job descriptions, and then really try to figure out uh, what is going to work. Okay, and Regina in, in the Netherlands. Yeah, it's actually quite different in the Netherlands. Um, we have the system of the comparable position and also the discussion mainly starts there. Um, when you have a unique uh, employee has a unique position in a company, you can simply dismiss when the position lapses. Um, but when there is comparable positions under Dutch law, uh, quality or performance can actually really not be uh, a criteria for selection. Um, so um, um, there's also no system where you give points. It's quite simple, a balancing scheme with the age groups that you described. Um, we um, 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 uh, select the, the employees in different age groups. There are five age groups. And within um, the age groups, we select last in, first out, and we do it in a way that the um, um, that the people are um, uh, that, that the relative uh, amount of employees in the age group stay roughly the same before and after the reorganization. Um, so actually, um, a performance is really something that should not be um, uh, used in selection. That can become, uh, or that will probably become a little bit different after the 1st of July when you, we have the major uh, legislation change in the Netherlands, because then there will be a facility for um, trade unions under collective bargaining agreements to uh, put together themselves a dismissal committee and um, when there's such a dismissal committee, it's also possible to um, um, make their own selection criteria, uh, in which case also um, a performance can be one of the selection um, elements. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, yes, of course. So, so the question, the question is, is whether the list of criteria is a statutory list in, in France and yes. Germany. Often this list would be in the collective agreement. If not, it will be in the, in the code, in the, in the code du travail, in the code which is the law. But that's a national code. That's a national code, that's right, yes. Same okay. for Germany. So the list is in the national code for uh, unfair dismissal. Okay, and, and very quickly, we've talked about the social plans. Um, in terms of the redundancy payments that are made, they'll be set out and they'll be agreed in the social plan. Is that, is that right? 
Mm -hmm. um, That's right. Laurie, yeah. can you just add a bit for the UK? Well, in the UK, calculated according to a formula based on length of service, age, and earnings. Okay, thank you. So um, here, here again, I'm sorry, but we, we have got really a difference between UK and, and the continent. Mm -hmm. Although it's, it's, it seems very generous to think that we have to care about people who would find it harder to find a new job, I think at the end of the day, we leave some companies in a difficult position with people who find it difficult to leave, but are pro probably not the best one for the company. I think that's probably right, isn't it? And we were talking earlier uh, this morning about Works Council uh, members yeah. being protected. Yeah, so um, maybe I would like to add one more thing to what you just said. Uh, uh, in Germany, and I think this is a big difference to the UK, and this is something we always hear is, it is nearly impossible to terminate somebody in Germany due to performance. Performance is not a reason. Uh, uh, if you show up every morning and do nothing wrong, uh, but do nothing, uh, it is not a reason to be terminated. Uh, in theory it is, in practice it isn't. Therefore, termination for operational reasons, so restructuring, is the way to get rid of people who do not perform. It is a shame that we, due to our German system, cannot be open with employees saying, sorry my friend, it is ending here because you are not performing. We are not allowed to do this. We have to say, sorry, you do a great job, but for reasons you, that are out of our control, we have to make your job redundant and you have to go. And this is a very unfortunate communication to the, to the employee, but we don't have any other way to do it. And therefore, the uh, criteria is so uh, uh, important to, because if you have to do it on operational reasons, you always have to focus on the social criteria. And in particular, now coming to your question, if you have protected employees like a works council member or the data protection officer or um, um, the uh, representative of the disabled in the company, they are 100% protected. You, you, ca you cannot terminate them uh, in, in a practical way. Um, it makes it very difficult uh, to deal with them. We very... so. I, I'm with uh, Regina that a good works council and a good works council re relation is not a it's, it's not a, a, a bad thing for a company. It is it is in the end it can be a really a benefit. But very often what we see is that the, the number of uh, that the, the list of works council members would be exactly the list of people you would make redundant if you if you could. Uh, they are only they only became works council members because they are protected and. Um, this is something that you need to manage somehow. Uh, and that makes it really uh, difficult in Germany. Yes, and is the position the same in, in the Netherlands regime? Yes, there's a provision to give notice for works council members. Yeah. Okay. And, and Olivier in France, the same? Yes, the same. Yeah, so it seems that you, don't, you turn up to work, do nothing, and join the works council. Um, now, we have a few moments for questions. Rebecca. Uh, the question is, um, who's in control of selecting the Works Council members? The, the Works Council in Germany is elected every four years by the employees. Same. And the same in the Netherlands? Same. Every two years in France. Okay. Uh, any, other, any other questions? Yes, John. Just a query, really. Are, are, they, are they, the Works Council positions sort of fought over? Lots of people want to become Works Council members. Mm. <laughs> the, the, question, the question is, does, does everybody want to become a member of the Works Council? Not so much in the Netherlands because you make yourself a little bit unpopular with the <laughs> with the uh, uh, higher management often. So that's more a practical thing. Yeah. In Germany, it is it depends on the business. So typically, the the, the, the new business IT uh, service businesses have less works councils. The it's more the old economy who is very strong in works councils. And. Uh, it happens in France that you don't have anybody who stands. So, no, it's not so popular. It's not, so, not such an easy job, in fact. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more? Yes. Um, in the UK, if we don't have an established body, we would nominate representatives if we're going to a protected consultation for redundancy. Um, what would be the equivalent in Europe if there wasn't a works 
So the question is, if, if there's no works council in Europe, what, what would be, would there be anything in its place? No consultation. You're free. You can uh, come to an employee representative committee and um, you're obliged to establish a works council from 50 employees up, but uh, it is sometimes uh, advised to uh, make this employee representative committee. Well, in France, I would say if you cannot uh, get the advice from the committee because there isn't one and there should be one, there would be um, a problem with the dismissal then. And at what, at what level do you need a works council in France? Uh, 50 employees. 50? Yeah. So if you were, say, at 45? 45, that's okay. That's okay, but so who would That's they, why so many companies are under 50. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, yes, one more question. Uh, it's, it's, it might be a very basic question. But in UK, we're going to do a termination or we've done, we've done some termination. The company goes ahead and does it, and then it's up to the individual if they're going to claim that there's a breach of the contract. But it's unfair. Um, I think I understand in the Netherlands that you have to actually get permission from a court to even to do an Okay, so the question is whether, whether, as in the Netherlands, one has to get a, a permission from the court to proceed to make somebody redundant. Excellent. No, not in Germany. You just give notice. So it's like in the UK, and then it's up to the yeah. employee or the yeah. Yeah. unions. Yeah. 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 The By the way, in Italy, it's the union who have to has to agree on the termination. I, I knew this by coincidence. <laughs> and and uh, We should, I think, just mention that the, 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 the people who are protected because they, they, yes. they are a representative of the workers cannot be dismissed before there is the authorization from the administration. It's the inspector uh, who is a, a civil servant who will have to get to give the authorization before the dismissal. If you do not get this authorization prior to the dismissal, this is a criminal offense. Lovely. That sounds I'm, I'm, very I'm, exciting. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not showing you a very bright picture of friends, I'm afraid. <laughs> there are other aspects of friends which are much nicer than this one. But about employment law, I, I, I'm afraid that we cannot really compete with you. And if it's, if it's a criminal offence, Olivier, what's, what, what sort of punishment would, could be uh, meted punishment, out? Punishment, it could be, in theory, it could be uh, go to jail. But, but luckily, so far, none of my client has been... <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, in principle, yes, it can, it can be uh, up to going to jail. Okay, and John, final question. Just one last question about France. I half remember that a works council can appoint a specialist to look at the business case. Is that right? That is absolutely right, and, and, and uh, I'm afraid, again, that my, my answer will, will link to bribery. I'm afraid that these experts are often companies which are linked to some of the unions, and therefore the, going, the money going there is effectively, effectively going somewhere in order to make the, the process work. Same in Germany. The same in Germany. <laughs> okay. It's not in the Netherlands, the, um, not yet. the, the conflict of, <laughs> of interest is not, but the Works Council in the Netherlands has uh, its own means to involve experts on several topics if it's, they feel it's necessary. Yeah. Okay. Rebecca, very final question. It's not a fine line. It's like always in uh, compliance. You, uh, you, you are in, in a gray area and you try to make gray, white or black. Uh, and it always depends on the case. Uh, if you, it's like give, uh, receiving presents. Uh, I know there are compliance schemes and code of conduct saying you are not allowed to take anything with more value than 20 pounds, euros, whatever where I would say for a CEO, this is not the right figure. For a uh, blue-collar worker, this might be the right figure. And th this is the same for, for works council. You can't say this, this amount is bribery, this is not. It's, it always depends. If this, actually this car went to the head of the works council of uh, VW, and he is representing 200,000 employees. 
it was really a question if this is something that is still in the area of his responsibility by representing so many employees and this responsibility coming with this job. And in the end, the courts found it was still too much. Uh, but it was really questioned if this is something that is too much. If you have a 50 employee company, I would bet that anything above 100 euro or 500 euro would cross the line.